Glenn, you're a Midwesterner. You were born in Wisconsin. You attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where you attained a teaching degree. And then later on, you attended Cranbrook's Academy of Art. But you came to art and textiles in a rather surprising and random way. Could you tell us something about that? Ohio gozaimasu, Josephine. While you're watching this, I'll be in Japan. It'll be nighttime there. Yes, I guess my route was a bit unusual. At, at uh, Wisconsin, I was a speech education major. It was during the Korean War, and so I was in the ROTC program for the U.S. Air Force. And after graduation, my wife and I were married, and we went off to great adventures, we thought, in the wide world, Columbus, Ohio. And it was a nine to five job in the Strategic Air Force, and we had lots of free time. So Shar discovered uh, a wonderful uh, program sponsored by Parks and Recreation, one of my great favorite programs, uh, that had ceramic classes and other art classes. So we started studying ceramics, eventually moved upstairs to the weaving studio, and found there an incredible exciting teacher who had graduated from Cranbrook in sculpture but she had taken courses in weaving as well and she was teaching weaving at the Columbus Recreation Art Center and we hit it off beautifully and I enjoyed weaving so much and spent months doing that and she then approached the idea of applying to Cranbrook and I said Twyla her name was Twyla Albers incredible woman this is ridiculous. I'm not prepared to enter that kind of, you know, institution. You should apply. I don't think so. You should apply. I don't think so. Apply. So I applied. And I was accepted and was delighted to do that. And so I can call myself, you know, sort of undergraduate of Parks and Rec and adult education. What would you say are some of the most important aspects of your Cranbrook experience, both as a student and then later as a teacher? Yeah, well, student, I had a lot of catch up to do because I did not have an art degree. So that was really a challenge for me, uh, trying to pick up the kind of background that most of the other students there had. You know, the program that I went through as a student was basically weaving. But by the time I came back to teach, I realized that the world was much wider than just weaving. And I think a key point was an exhibition organized by Jack Leonard Larson called Fabrics International, which the Cranbrook Museum had for a month or so. And I took the students there many times. And we realized together, myself and the students, that there was a lot of other things to be doing except weaving. And one of my students at that time, Mary Walker Phillips, who Jennifer will talk about or has worked with, um, took off with knitting. And I think partly inspired by the show that Jack Larson had organized and partly by my mentoring and encouragement, we, ex we explored other possibilities, non-woven, knitting, knotting, and other related fields. A second point was I had a student, Mita Parker Johnston, who was a non-traditional student who was keen on establishing some kind of teaching program study with commercial dyes, which were almost unknown in this country in art schools. I had been exposed to it a bit in Denmark and the Fulbright, but she was determined that we were going to discover how we could use these commercial dyes and use them in a studio situation in a art school like Cranbrook. So I said, go with it, Mita. And she found the materials. She developed the techniques. And we then established a very, I think, very dramatic and dynamic screen print program and other kinds of techniques like shibori tie-dye. And at some point, she said, we should write a book about this. I said, I have no idea about writing books. She said, I don't either. But I think we can do it together. So we did, and we published uh, Design on Fabrics, which was, you know, a kind of Bible for many years in the surface design world. And it really is part of that whole idea of the birth of surface design as a strong concentration in schools and among artists around the country. Much of your work relates to cultural facets, but some of your work, like your collaborative piece, Ghosts of Mesopotamia, are overtly political. What can you share with us about the inspirations and the reasons for this? 
You know, in the early periods of fabric history, we don't have so much fabric, so we had to rely on other sources like sculpture. And there are sculptures from Mesopotamia around 2500 BCE that show a garment called Kanaukas that is a kind of flounced garment that seems to be an imitation of sheepskin. I've been long intrigued by this garment. And <clears throat> when I was invited to uh, participate in the huge international uh, exhibition of tapestry in Wuji in Poland, it occurred to me that I might do something with this whole idea of Kanaukas. What to do, how to do, I wasn't sure. But I wanted to make garments that were in some way influenced by the original sculptures, but still had a touch of my own. So I searched around for materials, and it occurred to me that my Athens Banner Herald red plastic delivery bags could be a possible recycling event and also create the kind of layered look that I wanted. So with the plastic <laughs> delivery bags, uh, plastic garden fencing, and a tacking gun, the one that's used to put labels on, price tags on garments and so on, constructed these garments, full-length garments. Most of those illustrated in sculpture are skirt length, or skirt, but I wanted to make complete garments. Then I made the connection with Mesopotamia, today Iraq, the Iraq War, which I was much opposed to, and was really saddened by all the death that it created, but especially by civilian deaths. So I did six, eight garments for this show in Poland and named them Kanaukas, Ghosts of Mesopotamia. It's a kind of homage to those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians who are still dying today. Then when that show was over, I decided to install a similar show in Kyoto at my gallery there, Gallery Gallery in Kyoto. And I made uh, additional garments, there were 15 in that show. And I collaborated with a, uh, my friend and Bhutto dancer, Ima Tenko, who did a performance, as she had done in previous shows of mine, uh, related to this exhibition. And then it was, there was an opportunity to show these in Athens, Georgia. And I made a total of 50, there were a total of 50 garments in a very large space. And I collaborated with a former student, Andrea Trombetta, performance artist, who also performed in the space uh, amongst these garments. And they were of various sizes. Huge men's sizes, medium-sized women's sizes, small ones for ch representing children, because all of these ages and genders of civilians were and have been and are still being killed in ethnic violence in uh, Iraq. And that's sort of the strongest of political statements that I've made with my work. You recently retired after teaching for over 40 years. Much of it was at the Lamar Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia. What would you say have been some of the most important aspects of your teaching career? Mentoring to me has always been, you know, uh, a most important teacher responsibility to students. And by, do by doing that uh, in so many ways, exposure, exposure, expansion of experiences, whether it was, you know, the world of historic text fabric textiles or processes or materials or thinking deeply and ever constantly about concept. All of these things, to me, were the most important things that I could pass on. And your artistic career? Travel throughout, you know, this creative life of mine. Prior to the Fulbright in Denmark, traveled around the U.S. a bit, spent several visits to New York and the art scene there. But, you know, that, that proved to be, you know, an incredible opportunity, not to just to learn uh, many new textile techniques and experiences in, in Kubenhaun, but to be able to travel throughout Europe. I had an inheritance from an uncle who died, and we bought a red Fiat Cinquecento and drove all over Europe in that little red car and was exposed to museums, culture, architecture, food, people from, you know, the northern Scandinavian countries to Italy and Spain and 
it completely opened our eyes to a whole new world. And at the same time, interestingly, and I think this is not uncommon about people who travel outside the U.S., brings a new appreciation of you know, what you have in your own country and the cultural resources there. So that was the first big exposure. A whole year in Europe was incredible. But when I came to Georgia in 1967, establishing the program in fabric design there, and what I wanted to do at that time was to prepare students for a, an, an experience like Cranbrook. That is, they should know something about the history of fabrics. They should know something about structure, weaving, and other non-woven structures. They should know something about surface design and dyeing. And they should be well-tuned and thinking about concept and ideas. UGA was so supportive of me and, and my research time, number one. I always had at least one term free for research. And adding the summer to that of, oftentimes meant I had six months for work uh, of my own. And then we had a Ford Foundation grant given to the School of Art, and that allowed faculty members to do travel wherever they wanted to go. So I went with my family two times to uh, United Kingdom, basic, based in London. And by that time, I had established courses in the history of fabrics, and so had a fantastic time of researching the history of fabrics in the British Museum, in Victoria and Albert, the Museum of Mankind, the William Morris Collection, and many other places. And then in 1979, did Around the World in 90 Days. Um, finally decided that we needed to explore Asia. So we spent a month in Japan, some days in Hong Kong, Thailand, and a month in India, and a final stop in London on the way home. And that total experience was mind-blowing and so expansive. And it was Japan that sort of beckoned back, you must come back, you must come back. And we planned to do that. Uh, unfortunately, my wife contracted cancer and she was not able to return with me. But she urged me before her death, you must go back to Japan. And that's where I've been for the last 30 plus years, some part of each year. As you look back, are there some moments that are particularly memorable for you or changes in the field that really stand out? Well, certainly the, the visit to Japan. And it's continued to influence my work, to make me, you know, a productive, creative artist in that environment, to live the life of an artist with studio, museums, galleries, artist friends, beautiful environment, terrific food, architecture. Um, yeah, if that's a moment in my life, in being introduced to Japan was that moment. Changes in the field, I mean, it's, uh, it's unwinding. It's totally unwound. Um, everything is happening, and this is, I think, very exciting, even for those of us who are in our ancient periods of work in this field. It's so exciting to see, you know, processes of every kind, materials that you would never have dreamed of before, concepts that were way out in left field maybe a few years ago that are now accepted. So I think, you know, this total expansion of what the fabric field is all about, and we include so many things that are unfabric in that definition, but total expansion, I would say, is the most significant thing in terms of the field. Josephine, it's been great, and I hope that you and the other panel members and your audience uh, have gained something from this discourse.